This is the Literary Licensed Podcast with your hosts, Vicky Ray, John Wilson, and Keith Shorgo. Discussing book to screen and everything in between. Coming at you from the UK and USA. They keep it real. Oh, it's beautiful. Just glorious. Like it used to be. And our mother. She's back. Our darling. Restored to us. In all her beauty. Her glory. With us. Once again. Obsession. Good wait night and day Saw your name when I pray In my heart night and day Till you come my way I could wait night and day Be the sky blue or grey In my heart night and day For your love to stay Obsession Welcome to the Literary License Podcast, and welcome to the Out of the Mind of Curtis Month. And of course, we'll be discussing everything out of Dan Curtis's, well, not everything, but the films and television series that we're dealing with, we'll be talking about. And our first offering is our book to screen episode of Burnt Offerings. Burnt Offerings is a 1973 American horror novel by Robert Mar- Mar- Marisco. Maris- 
Morasco. Morasco, I think. By Robert Morasco. Yes, people, I'm still massacring surnames. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Basically, the book came out by um, Delacorte Press, um, and the, the novel was originally been conceived as a screenplay before Maricosco rewrote it into a novel. It has, of course, been adapted into a film of the same name, which came out in 1976, which was directed by Dan Curtis. So, before we get any further, Vicky, what have you been up to lately? Oh, my God. Just race, race, racing with the BMX. We've been to, like, I don't know how many cities, and it's all been hot here in Texas. Um, last weekend, we went to San Antonio. Um, I'm trying to catch up on all the stuff I've been wanting to watch. I finally, I think I finally missed, finished Deadwood. I've been uh, binging on Dark Shadows. Like, I'm like in the first three collections from when everything started, from the roots up. I caught up on Sabrina and Riverdale. Um, just watching a couple movies here and there. I finished Night of Dark Shadows the other night ago because I guess I'm on a 70s binge this week. I guess we mm -hmm. have to be. But yeah. really, other than that, just we're doing, we did 4th of July fireworks last night because we have a big park outside of our house and just kind of chilling because it's summertime. Hmm. And I love myself. I haven't really been up to a lot dealing with some personal friend stuff. And outside of that, not a lot, actually. I've um, been watching this, that, but nothing that really pokes the brain. Oh, I started watching Big Little Lies season two, which I'm, it's interesting. Meryl Streep's now into it, you know, and it's okay. Um, liking it, you know, it's something to watch, and that's it, really. It's um, just a lot of work and getting things ready and um, working on this computer game script that um, I've been commissioned to do. That's about it, really. Yeah, I've been also, I've got some, well, I'm a ghost hunter when I have the time. But my friends at Buried Secrets Paranormal Out West is on Amazon now, and they're the real deal people. So if you want to watch something that isn't staged, Make sure you catch them on Amazon Prime because they are the real deal. Now, I guess that brings us to the Burt Ghost. Offerings novel. Um, basically, the publication first came out in 1973, as we said before, by Delcourt Press. And then it was re-released in 1976 by Dell Books. It's a tie-in with the tie-in of the movie. And also because The Shining was released by Stephen King around this time. Then, of course, it came out with uh, limited 150 copies in 2012 by Centipede Press. And now it's out by Vance Court Press in 2015. It's a it's it's an odd novel because it was a bestseller, but it's almost forgotten about, which is quite yes, completely. I mean, you know, what did you, what were your thoughts about the novel itself? Go for it. Uh, what I thought about the movies was uh, uh, the film, the book, the, the book, film. Book. Sorry, I need more coffee today. It's like ninety five degrees, and it's it's just about twelve o'clock, so it's going to be a real bitch of a day. But I've already <laughs> been outside trying to save my plants, so please forgive. But um, the, the book was written in the 70s. We had high inflation. There was unemployment. There was an oil crisis. And there was spiking energy prices and a recession. There was also still ongoing desegregation of schools. So this is the time we're talking about, Son of Sam stuff. And the Sentinel was out about the same time in 74, like Keith said, The Shining. Then it was followed by the Amityville Horror and also The House Next Door. So we had a series of uh, books like this that was all about houses for, for whatever strange reason and everything that came with the house. And I kind of liked it. But the, the thing is, I mean, I didn't really, it kind of got, I mean, it was so hard to separate the book from the, the, uh, the movie because it kind of really stuck right spot on with it. It was almost like they even took the screenplay from the book. I mean, because there was very little different in there except for the ending, which still kind of, I'm not, I haven't figured out the ending of the book quite so much. I don't know if that was a leave it up to you. Like I know that the wife with the mom, so, sorry, spoilers, um, Marion, she was like absorbed into the house for her energy. See, I took it like, um, okay, well, how I took it is because they have that moon um, planet door and then there's always this buzzing and this humming. Right. And, it, and apparently the humming was like, you know, psychotic. Like, so, so I was kind of, I'm picturing it as like a heartbeat. It's like, mm, right. mm, mm, sort of thing. And my feeling is, is that when she went into the room, that she became the battery. She's like the battery that's now powering the house. And that's well, going to allow. She went white. She went gray to white. So clearly yeah. something was being sapped out of her. Yeah, I, I picture it like being the battery. And so basically is that she's going to keep the house going and then finally the battery is going to die and the house is going to start decaying until the next lot come. And right. then the cycle starts over again. And that's how I took it because 
the thing is, is that when you look at the pictures or when they mention the pictures and stuff like this, there's never any mention of any of the mothers. It always seems to be fathers and children. Right. You know, the way this guy. So I assume that what happened, the mother gets absorbed, either absorbed into the house or she's like the bat, she becomes the battery or in the heart well, of the then, house. Who, well, <clears throat> I, I forget. Who was it that came in? Was it the caretaker that came in and watched her? Said something about her, like, looking, I don't know, it was almost angelic like scene. So, I don't know. Did you get the yeah. end? I'm so confused by the end. I was like, going, okay, I was looking up on the internet. So how did this book end? And even no matter what I looked up, it's just like no one really gave me any answers because it was really convoluted the end. I don't even know what happened to, to um, Ben and Dave. I know that they were sick and and Ben was like, like in a catatonic state, and Dave. Well, I, I mean, okay. I mean, what's what's quite interesting with the book, which you know, when we get into the film, it's, it's played slightly different. But we kind of, I mean, we kind of get this, um, I guess, neurotic mother who's always cleaning, and uh, and the noise is the noise is always too much for her, and you know, the, and the how the flat that they're living in in the middle of the city is always too hot. There's too many people around, and then always you, looking for a place to go. I guess she was circling the newspapers all the time because she just had to get out of the city, sort of thing. And he was an English teacher, and it didn't seem like they were suffering too much. It sounded like they almost had a good life, but it was that time in the '70s, and there was a heat wave, and there was crime, and just all kinds of crap was going on mm -hmm. in the city back then. So, yeah, I also think of the simple fact that it's, it's like, you know, I just think that's like you, you know, if you're middle class or you know rich. You know, the thing about living that way is like, in the, you know, you live in the city, but the city becomes empty because if you got the money, you move to, you know, you leave the city during the summer. Most people you do because it's so, it sucks. And see, well, back in the day, yeah. I don't know, the early 80s, it was just hot as hell in New York City. Yeah. It was hot in New Jersey. I mean, back then, it's like, I don't know, people, I thought everybody had AC, mm. you know? And it's. You know, so when they do find the house and something like that, and they finally do make it to the house, and I thought, I thought this is what I quite liked about the book. So you had like this whole thing about them, and they got they're quite a loving relationship. They yeah. they, have, they have regular sex and stuff like this. Everything's and they seem, fine. And they seem to be quite compatible with each other. And then they go on the long journey, and everyone's looking forward. And you got the sandwiches and the picnic basket, and da little Davies, you know, happy. Where are we going? We're going on a trip, sort of thing. And then. This is, this is what I quite like about the book. And when we get to the movie, the movie kind of misses some of these important, you know, setting up points. But basically, you know, they go down this long road and the, and the, the sides of the road are like closing in on them sort of thing. And they go they're for like- They're getting engulfed by the branches and stuff. Yeah, and they're going miles and miles. And all of a sudden it's like the people that you met in the first couple chapters are all of a sudden they're starting to change a little bit. And I quite like that. It's like, you know, the father who's like very like happy go like, yeah, okay, I'll do this. We'll, you know, let's give this a try. Yay, we're on an outing. All of a sudden, it becomes a bit more gloomy, and she becomes a lot more anxious. And the other, and the boy who's like really chatty becomes just quiet and sullen. And then of course, then it opens up into the house. And then it and then I thought it was quite interesting that basically then what we have is the mother. All of a sudden, she enters the house and she's all automatically just an armored with the whole thing. And the husband's like, uh... Was the house in disrepair when they got there, or was it just going down the shitter, literally? Well, it was disrepair, because, I mean, the thing is, is, like, you, you have the caretaker taking stuff out, and it's, like, it's broken, and it's, you know, it's, you're taking out all the, you know, the dead plants, and the, the cracks, and there's cracks in the wall, and, you know, pictures are falling off hooks, and, like, you know, there's places where the pictures are missing, and there's just dirt around them and everything like right. that. Right. And the floor is all scratchy and the paint's peeling off and, you know, and I, I quite like that. You got like a nice understanding of what this house is sort of thing. Well, it sounds like it's enormous, mm. you know? Yeah. And I also like the fact that, you know, Davey's out running around in the field and he gets hurt and he comes in. And then all of a sudden there's like a little bit of life, a, a little bit slight change happens in the house. And well, the guy, what was his name? Mr. Uh, but brother, Al Alder Ice. Is that how you say the yeah. name? Yeah. Elder, uh, he he, uh, he elder saw life. the boy get hurt and he didn't say anything. <clears throat> no, because he, you know, and that's what I quite like about it. There's this mystery. It's like, what the hell's going on here? And you don't know, you don't know what the hell's going on in the book whatsoever. No, you don't. And, you know, it's like, you know, it's all yours for this price here. And you, all you have to do is pay half the price now and then the, the, the other half when, before you leave. 
and then everything and then and the, it's still the father's like no i really don't think so it's like uh you know we need to look around and the and the mom's like you know like really excited totally excited well, after going through my notes here, I kind of figured out why, why I thought of the movie. As I said, it was originally written as a screenplay. Yeah. So that explains that. I did not know that till I was going through my stuff here. I mm -hmm. just like kind of like little fine print. Mm -hmm. It was a slim 264 pages. Mm -hmm. But even like when Davy gets hurt and they go into the kitchen and the kitchen's all run down and they turn the water on, it's all kind of rusty and stuff like that. And they, you know, they bandage him up. And and the, mom, and the mom says push and then if, and then of course the husband goes is there one more catch and then they have to feed Mrs. Alderice who's upstairs their dear beloved I mean who mother, stays who, and rents a house and, and has like an elderly old lady that locks herself up in a in a room you know and you're supposed to go up and feed her all the time it's like there's no way like three times a day and but the thing is you can't just feed her every anything there's a specific meal you have to feed her probably yes and that's what and this is like that, I found this quite interesting because. You know, the father, he's the voice of reason. He's like, no, no way. And meanwhile, you got the mother's like, I'll do it. That's fine. I'll do it. What's the problem? What's the problem? Yeah. And you're thinking like, you know, and meanwhile, you get this couple, you know, this brother and sister going, our dear old mother, we love her so dearly, but we, you know, we leave her in the house with strangers. I know, which is like, I would never leave my elderly mother with a bunch of people I didn't know. So right there, should, I mean, he knew, though, through the whole novel, her husband, Ben, knew that there was some bullshit going down with this house. Mm. And he, he just was, he was immediately uncomfortable. So, you know, she wasn't, she was already like vaping in, so. Well, that's, that's what's quite interesting because even after they leave and he's like, no, we're not doing this sort of thing. And she's pouting and you know, Davy's looking for a sandwich seat and she's pouting all the way home. And there's something that she doesn't do. It's like she kind of gives in to him all the time. You know, so you get this impression that she gives in to him. So the simple fact is like, she's just pouting in bed. And then, of course, he changes his mind. And then we go into the main story, basically, of what, you know. Of the, all their adventures. Story. But the doctor towards the end of the book, when Aunt, was it Aunt Elizabeth? Is that her name, Aunt Elizabeth? I think I'm yeah, wrong. Yeah, Aunt Elizabeth. Yeah, well, and the doctor, you know, says, well, I can't even find you on the map. There's no, such and such street does not exist. So, right, you know, I mean, this place was like off the map anyway. And I mean, it's just creepy. There's just some things I will do. Creepy's fine, but this is, you know, I would like, no, I'm going down the beach to rent a cottage somewhere. There's no way I would stay there. Well, it, you know, but there are just a little bit of problems with the book because the thing is, is that, yeah, Ben has kind of switched on. He doesn't know quite, he doesn't quite understand it sort of thing and then you know they, but then you have the incident at the pool and the way the book describes is that the the it's the, the it's dirty they can't get the leaves out of it i don't know why they're swimming in it but you know there's the rusted you know ladder the the cement's cracked and there's shit, you know plants growing through everything it's a, yeah. a total disrespair the water thing's not working nothing and then we get the thing where something overtakes ben and he plays a bit too harshly with david davy right. and and then the next day it's like they they go to the pool and it's all clean and everything's thingy and then she goes oh you know i cleaned it and yeah like, i mean i don't know how she could have made it look like take about 50 years off the face of the house you know well, you know, a simple fact is like, you know, you know, the all the cracks in cement are gone. The, the you know, the 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 rust is gone. The pump is working. You know, all I had to do is I just banged it with a hammer a couple times. But even if you got the water clear again, it doesn't explain everything about what's happening around that pool. Right. And it's kind of weird, but Ben doesn't really up on that, which I found is a bit weird. You know? Here you got this person go there. Well, okay, let's sit there and say that you're living in a house, right? And you got this disrepaired pool, right? And basically, with everything that we said was going wrong. Right. And then the next day, you go out, and your other half sits there and goes, I cleaned it. But we're talking about, like, the cement and everything's redone. Right. You know what I mean? You just go, uh... Um, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it was sort of like magic overnight. So I, the house is probably immediately... I don't know if it was trying to sap the energy out of them as much as it was trying to get rid of them. I think it well, was. I think, what, I, I think it was, for me, it was feeding off their energy because that's the reason why, you know, like Anne Elizabeth is getting more and more tired. And to the simple fact that, and I thought this was quite good in the book because, you know, you get these little things are happening. And, the, and this is a book about a lot of little, little things happening that kind of 
after you finish, you, re you think back on it as like, these little things that are actually adding up to something sort of thing. Right. But, you know, a simple fact, like, you know, she gets all the, the silver, you know, and this, again, this is where it goes kind of weird because she gets all the silver out. She's polishing it. But at the same time, like the floors are becoming polished and like they've been sanded and polished and, you're and just no one, pristine. Everything's pristine all of a sudden. Yeah, slowly. It's like it's slowly like returning into something. You know, the wallpaper's, you know, not peeling anymore. And then, you know, Elizabeth, get, you know, but I mean, you know, I guess I could understand the thing about Elizabeth and Ben, you know, but him not picking up on that because she is, she's supposed to be an old lady sort of thing. So, you know, and sometimes when the old people, you know, get older and then the time comes for them to pass, sometimes they do deteriorate quite quickly. Right. But the thing is, is, but this is all within the first three weeks. They're only there for two months. They're only supposed right. to be there two months. And all this is happening like within the first three weeks. I felt sorry for Aunt Elizabeth. I mean, I don't know, was it like torturing her? It didn't really give her a stroke, but it just kind of twisted her in some kind of massive pain. <laughs> well, as I thought, the reason why I thought it was zapping the energy out, and, and I guess this is from working in rheumatology, is I, it's almost like, you know, what happens with older people and the reason why they get osteoarthritis and stuff like that is because the, everything starts drying out. And then it's, not, it's almost like she's becoming this dried out husk in that way. And so like when she tried to move, like all of a sudden all the bones are breaking. You know what I mean? Because remember, she, she tries oh, to turn. Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah. She turns and then everything's crunching. And then um, when Ben comes in, like the holder is like so much pain because he holds her and it's like he feels things breaking inside her. So it's almost like, you know, the, so to me, I felt like, you know, it's just drying, drying out every single life essence inside the person. And that's how right. it's rebuilding itself. So, yeah, and so for me, <laughs> and so that's the reason why when we get to the end, the way that it ends, that's why I think that maybe she's the battery. She becomes like the human battery for the place. Well, because what's the deal with the, the gold and blue brocade dress? I mean, she starts wearing funky things. Remember? Well, I think, I think that has to be is that because the house is overtaking her personality. I mean, so much that when Elizabeth dies, she doesn't see that she can't leave the house. She can't leave the house. Right. You know? So Ben takes Davy off to the funeral, calls her. Oh, I miss you so much. I miss you so much. Oh, we'll come back. You know, it's kind of like, you know, you know, it's, and I mean, even Elizabeth's whole stature changes. I mean, look what happens to Davy when um, they think that, you know, we almost dies from gas poisoning from the heater that yeah. mysteriously turns on. And when that happens, all of a sudden all the clocks start. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's true. What was the deal with the clocks? She wasn't winding them to keep them going. Well, uh, basically, to... the, the, house, the house is kind of stopped in time. It's, it's almost, and that's why I think that these are, like, they're like batteries. And the reason why I think of them as batteries, because, you know, like, you know, when basically if you're sucking out the energy sort of thing, that means you're giving like an electrical energy out. And that's what batteries right. do. And they and batteries only last so much. So basically, because the battery is quite dead, you're, you know, it's taken a while to restart it, like a car battery. So, so right. the other people in the house are like the jumpers, the jumper cables. So when you know, so when they're starting to die, and I mean, a big thing happens that's actually shortening their life even more. It's like a jolt of thingy that's, and all of a sudden, like the clock starts. Well, I mean, who goes gray that coming. fast? <clears throat> they said Marie Antoinette well, was gray right before they guillotined her. So I mean, I guess it's possible. <laughs> Well, you know, the thing is, but they do say that when you get older, you have less and less energy. And when you get, and maybe, maybe it's something to do, like when you have less energy, you become more gray. I don't well, you're know. A doctor, I mean, you know what? My, my friend and I were talking about this. If our mm -hmm. cells are regenerating constantly, why do mm -hmm. we get old and die? You know? <laughs> well, because the degeneration part of your body slows. Right. You know, like when you're younger, you're, you know, your cells are regenerating at night. Like, a very fast rate. As you get older, the regeneration is slowing. That's the reason why, like, if you're a smoker and you quit before the age of 30, your lungs will probably come back within seven years. Does that but mean you... we're fucked? Oh, yeah, <laughs> probably. But I mean, but then if you wait till you're 50 or 60s, yes, your lungs will rejuvenate, but they're not going to go back to 100% in the seven years. It's going to take longer. Right. Because and if you look at the human race anyway, we're all on borrowed time because... You know, we are like a, we're we are like a battery we're running around. You know, we're like these battery beings rocking around and slowly the battery flowing down. Right. You know? right. The moment you're born, you get the strongest battery when you're born, and eventually it wears down. That makes and sense. Then, it just you know, sucks. You're like a car. I mean, you're <laughs> you're basically. 
but you're basically like a car, you know, when you buy a new car, it's brilliant. And then eventually, you know, as the car gets older and you use it more, it starts, things start breaking down and you have to start replacing things on it. Yeah, we had to replace the header on my car. It's just like, yeah. okay, well, it's good for another hundred grand. Can't do that with me though. But then, you know, so then, then Ben, you know, but then, you know, another thing what I guess that causes people to weaken and stuff like this is, I guess, is when Ben has this night, this recurring nightmare that he hadn't had since he was a kid. Right. And that's what started, um, and, you know, that's what started his decline when he started having those. And then, of course, he became weaker. And, of course, the youngest and most strapping one who's, you know, cells are rejuvenating, like you said, is Davy. So I guess that's probably the reason why Davy had to die a bit quicker because, you know, if they waited to drain him down, it's going to take a lot longer, probably. Right. And the book would be a lot longer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we didn't want that. We wanted to keep it a slim 264. It was a really easy read, though, people. It was a good book. Yeah. But, I mean, I, mean, it, I, it, I really I, enjoyed it. I mean, I think Ben's catatonic stage is basically is like, you know, I think that's, you know, between the, the recurring nightmare that is so real and the simple fact that coming to the realization that the woman that you married who was one person has now become something totally different and he's so bitchy towards him in the book. I mean, my God, you know. I mean, he's, well, he's and all, and and all the things that are going on. You know, I mean, picture it as like, like you go into this rundown house, you know, within three to four weeks, it's like it's rebuilding itself. You know, I mean, you know, before he goes catatonic, you got to remember the, the roof shingles are falling off the roof and they're being replaced by new sh shingles. Yeah, yeah, that was creepy. And he's trying, and he's trying to leave and the, and the bushes and everything won't let him go. You know, and that's what caused him to go catatonic, wasn't it? But at the same time, you, you know, this is what, you know, this is one of the problems of the book. At the same time, you got Davy. It's like, what? Yeah. You know, I was like, no, mama, where's mama? Where's mama? It's like, well, your mama just yelled at you for not wanting to use a goblet. And she's been a total bitch to you because you broke the bond. And all of a sudden, it's like, your dad's trying to take you away and you're crying for your mother. Yeah. So there's some weird I would have definitely, I would have, I, I don't know. I, I would have left. Just, yeah. You know that this story was written originally, it said, I don't know if this is true, so don't be getting really racist and mad at me, people. It said it was supposed, it said Burn Offerings was a slender 264 pages. It was originally intended to be a black comedy, but as Morasco said in an interview, it just came out black, whatever that means. So, I guess, I mean, well, I mean... I have to admit, I didn't see any humor in it at all. I didn't even, see any. Not unless it's like humor. white people just don't ever leave the house, you know? Yeah. I mean, I guess the black humor would be is it's like, you know, this old, you know, this brother and sister, which, you know, that's that's strange within itself. You got this brother and sister, obviously neither one have ever been married, and they, and they go on holiday together. You know, like, you know, like sometimes you get like these, twins who never married and they just spend their whole life together yeah and you know and then they're like 70 years old and they're like they're still hanging around dressed alike it's kind of, it was kind of like that it's still like, never it's, yeah not had an experience of life on their own but there is something weird about that you know it's, it's like it's, Karen, weird. it's sort of like you know uh, like richard and karen carpenter american horror story kind of weird yeah but you know the thing is is that I did like the epilogue of this book a lot, where the Alavice comes that. back in, and then you find out that the weird caretaker is actually part in on it as well. And I thought that that was a nice little twist. Well, you kind of knew he was in on it. Well, the thing is, you weren't quite sure because at the beginning, you know, he's just they're really like going, "Oh, come on, you know, whatever his name." I, I'm going to call him Clyde. I don't think that's what his name was, but he's <laughs> like, you know, he's like this buttering clod person who's like walking around dropping things, and it's like, and they're like. Ugh. God, you know what I mean? Right. So, yeah, you know, so at the beginning, I for me, I wasn't quite sure if he was part of it, but I like the fact that he shows up to find out what's going on inside the house, and it's kind of like, oh, you know, which they miss, you know, when we get to the movie, they miss that part out as well. But then, then they come back, and then I like the idea that they, they take another picture of the house, and it's all pristine and stuff, and they hang it in its place, and, I, and, it, and like all the pictures of the house, you know what I mean, at different time frames and stuff like that. <laughs> well, maybe almost drowning his son in, in, in the pool was probably something they would laugh about. I mean, I don't understand where he's getting the black comedy from, mm. but that's what it was intended. 
and he was they was noted in interviews saying that what that's mm -hmm. what he said. But it did come out, but later on, that, that did uh, spur on The Shining and the Amityville Horror, which are kind of like rewrites, possibly, of this book. Yeah, I mean, I guess I guess it's probably more closely related to probably The Shining, because The Shining feeds off the psyche. Well, the book, The Shining, feeds off the psyche, the psyche of the people, doesn't it? It's like, yeah. you know, that's what the whole book's kind of about. So maybe Stephen King was, you know, this came out before his book, so maybe he was slightly lean from what happened in this book to come out with his own version. Well, that's I mean, when he was know. like up and coming and he, he was still a hungry author. And, you know, I've, I've been really, really entertained the thought of reading many of his books lately. I mean, I love his old stuff, mm -hmm. but I haven't really got my hands on anything new lately. I think the last newest thing was probably like the gunslinger and the black tower. And Well, I read like two or three of those and I kind of, I kind of got bored with them. So I think I read the first th two or three. Right, the I read the first two. The drawing, I remember the drawing of the three was kind of labor intensive. And then one of them was okay, actually. I was, I was like, okay, I can understand. This one's okay. And then, and then I don't know. So, I mean, it kind of lost me. It, but it was fantasy. I mean, I'm, I, don't, I don't do well with fantasy. Yeah, Amityville Horror came out. And well, that's just history right there. Who doesn't know about the name of a horror, so. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, house, you know, houses have always been quite good. I mean, you know, you, you start out with The Haunting of Hill House with J Shirley Jackson, don't you? So it's, and it kind of moves from there. We all know that Keith loves the book, but he doesn't like the new, whatever the rewrite was, or the movie. Oh, no, the, the, the miniseries. The miniseries on Netflix. Yeah, the Netflix one. I said before, as you know, as previous episodes, it's, it's not, and... You know, it's not Shirley Jackson's Haunting of Hill House. They used the title and that was it. So for me, it's okay. I mean, I like it if I don't if I don't reflect on Shirley Jackson's and think of it as a totally different story that has nothing to do with it. Right. They just use the title. And I'm okay with it then. But I guess I was just really excited that I thought it was going to be Shirley Jackson's The Haunting. And it's not. Yeah, I was I was kind of thinking it was going to be that because I remember the old movie. You know, I really I know that the '70s stuff is cheesy, people and campers out there. But I mean, you gotta watch them. I mean, they're just so good. I mean, well, so the original haunting is great. I mean, yeah. that still lives up to it. The remake is horrible. The Liam Neeson one. And oh um, my god, oh my god. I I mean, I I struggled through that. I mean, it's like I can't believe I just paid seven dollars. It was seven dollars for that one. It's like, please just take me out in the parking lot and do me. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, but when, I mean, one of my problems with the miniseries of The Haunting of Hill House is like the house wasn't that grand. It was okay. They just showed that one part of that what the house was the stairway yeah. and the, the foyer that comes in the, to the stairway. And then they had that one side of the house that looked like it had a lot of windows. It was like a a walkway across to maybe another um, wing of the house. It's like they didn't have enough money to do the whole house. It was like they, dark shadows. they probably didn't. I mean, <laughs> it's I like thought dark, that dark shadows. You only saw a couple rooms. <laughs> oh, I know dark shadows. What was it? They come in. Was it that that the foyer? You go immediately to the left, and there's the door where I still don't know where that door goes to underneath the, the stairwell. One, the one in the, no, that goes to the kitchen. Okay, so they got this. Huge that's house. Where, that's all you got. That's where Mrs. Johnson's always coming out with a tray of tea or whatever. Mrs. Johnson, that door you know, if I was back then, I would have told them to get a wig that was more believable. If I, you know, if I was Mrs. Johnson, I'd be like, when are you going to hire me some fucking help? It's not like you don't have the money. <laughs> I know. Money's not money's that we don't me. love Dark Shadows. We're huge fans, people. We're just being assholes. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll be getting into that soon. Yeah, so, please. Um, yeah. <laughs> please, please don't take our license plate numbers down. <laughs> So I guess I, this brings us to the film of the same name, of Bird Offerings. Oh, now, yeah. the film came out in 1976. It was an American mystery horror film, was what they described it. And it was directed by Dan Curtis. Before this, of course, Dan Curtis is most famous for Dark Shadows. And he made two films based on Dark Shadows, was House of Dark Shadows and Night of Dark Shadows, um, with various degrees of success. This time, he... He had a quite a good cast, really. I mean, yes. he had Karen Black, who was at the top of her game, Oliver, Oliver Reed, Betty Davis, Lee H. Montgomery, Eileen Hackett, which I love. Remember her from Bad Seed? Yes. Yeah. She was fantastic. Burgess Meredith and Anthony James in a smaller role. Burgess um, Meredith always plays some kind of dumb ass backwoods. <laughs> You know, the problem with Burgess Meredith that no matter, I mean, I do like him. You know, I, there's a lot of films I like him in, like Foul Play with Goldie Hawn and Chevy Chase right. and various other things. But 
every time I do see him, I think the penguin. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, no, most of the time, though, when I think of him, I think of Rocky, though. Mm. But not oh, so much yeah. the penguin, near as much as, 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 as Rocky, because he was such a big part, integral part of the Rocky series. Mm. I mean, when the film did come out, it did receive mixed reviews from critics. It won, but it did win several awards in 1977. And as you said before, it was originally set in Long Island, New York, and the, the movie moves the action to California and was the first movie to be filmed in Dunsmuir House in Oakland, California. Now, I don't know what Dunsmuir House is. It was probably a big, scary house. Apparently, it's a neoclassical revival architectural style, and it's listed in the U.S. National Register of Historical Places. Yeah, Wikipedia people are a wonderful thing. I'm not. Yeah, <laughs> we love you, Wikipedia. I know. Well, I mean, apparently, I get since it's the first movie that was filmed there. I mean, oh, okay, Phantasm was filmed there. Partners in Crime, A View to a Kill. So I married an axe murderer, Gloria, True Crime, and Delirium were all filmed there. So yeah, a lot of big ones there. Um, yeah, so I guess what we'll do is we're going to cut to a commercial break and the trailer of Burn Offerings and we'll be back after a word from our sponsor. Alexa, who is the greatest female athlete ever? The jury's still out on that one. Alexa, is Jessica Ennis Hill the greatest female athlete? Sorry, I'm not sure. Come on, Alexa, do you even like athletics? I don't have a body. Take out Vitality Health or Life Insurance today and you could get an Amazon Echo Dot, just like Jess. And to find your inner athlete, enable the Vitality Alexa skill for fitness and nutrition tips. To get your Amazon Echo Dot, just search Vitality. New member offer available on certain Vitality plans until the 30th of June 2018. Minimum monthly premiums, terms and conditions apply. Okay, Bradley, tell the class about your holidays. Yeah, it was really good. My dad built us a new kitchen. It's got wooden bench tops and some stupid self-closing drawers. There was a dishwasher that was a real and even a breakfast bar. Mum thought Dad was a massive. Get a kitchen installed without teaching your kids new words. Visit ikea.com.au. We can plan, deliver, and install the whole thing for you. It all began as a summer vacation. A young family found a beautiful old house. It had secluded, spacious grounds, a large swimming pool, magnificent furnishings. So you are the people who want to rent this house. Well, you mean it's $900 and then it's all ours? Well, if there is one other thing, it's hardly a catch. They thought it was the answer to their dreams, but it was the beginning of a nightmare. Oh, God! Oh, God! In this old house, up this staircase, Behind this locked door, something lives, something strange, something powerful, something evil. Stay away from that door! It will possess this woman. It will destroy this man. It will terrify this child. And no one can stop it. <coughs> Burnt Offering, starring Karen Black. Have you actually tried to tell me that this house is responsible? <coughs> Oliver Reed. This house is destroying us. Betty Davis. This house is getting so cold. <laughs> Burgess Meredith. And this house will be here long, long after you have departed, you believe? Oh, oh. Eileen Heckard. God, when it comes alive, tell them about it. Tell them what it's like. <laughs> Behind this door lies a horror beyond imagination. Who is it? Where did it come from? What does it want? When you find out, it will be too late. Oh, God! Oh, God! Burnt Offerings. Hello? What's your favorite scary movie? Um, I have a bunch of favorite movies. 
I watched them all on Shutter.com for only $4.99 a month. That's a scary low price. But if I had to pick a favorite, it'd probably be Scream. Oh. Yeah, it's the only streaming service that lets me watch hundreds of horror movies on demand. Uh, I'll be right back. Hello? Hello? Hello, are you gonna subscribe? Hello? Go to Shudder.com to subscribe. If you dare. We are one planet. We share one extraordinary home. We are millions of wonders, but we are all one world. If we only get one chance to save our planet, to protect it for the next generation, then we have to take it. This is our chance. This is our fight. For our planet, for our home, for all of us. Join WWF today. Hello, welcome back to the Literary License Podcast, and now we'll be discussing the Dan Curtis film, Burnt Offerings, the 1976 film starring Karen Black and Oliver Reed. Um, like, well, you know, I guess I'll start with you, Vicky. What are your thoughts of this movie? <laughs> <laughs> well, I liked the movie. I loved it, how were they filmed it. I thought it was, you know, the, the house was fantastic. I love I loved going through, rummaging through old places like that. Uh, I think we discussed this in, in private, me and you. We thought that maybe Karen Black and Oliver Reed quite possibly were not cast for this. They should have, might have picked somebody else. I don't know who they might have yeah. picked. But Betty Davis, fantastic. Betty Davis does no wrong. Doesn't matter what she does. She always kicks it. You know, but... Um, I think Oliver Hacker Reed was fantastic. Karen Black probably could have slid by in it. But Oliver Reed just wasn't doing it for me. He just didn't seem like he should have had that part. Well, I find my problem with this film basically is, and you know, you know, reading the book is even more evident. But the thing is, what you have with the book is you have these three main characters, and they're they're a different personality. You know, it's like you know, she's anxious. You know, he's a college professor, um, and they're quite happy, and they're you know sort of thing and they're looking for a way to get out of the city you know he doesn't really want to but he figures you know if it's gonna make her happy you know, it would be quite nice to get out of the city for a change for right. the summer and you kind of got this like kind of loving family and even though you know she she is neurotic because everything's like oh davy don't go too far you know i need to clean she's like ocd about everything but um but and then, but then you get like you know the piano playing all the time. Like you know she's sitting there and she's like she's finished cleaning and the piano starts playing it every day at three o'clock. And the air conditioner makes a lot of noise and they're trying to sleep but it's too hot so you have the window open and of course you can hear everyone because they're in the apartment complex. Right. And I like and I like that. But here in the movie, what we get it starts off and they're in their station wagon. They're, and they're just driving in. Yeah. And and then you and then you're missing the great big. Re- reveal of the house right you know, the thing is they, you know the gates are there and they go around the corner and there's the house voila so you don't get the, all the trees and the bushes and stuff like this and you know it's important because that does play a part which they do show in you know when they're trying to the, escape we have when they're trying to escape it's like well, where did all these fucking branches come from because they weren't there before right sort of thing and yeah, I mean the house is run down, and it, you know it's fine. You know, and we, you know, and then we go back to the book territory, and this is, and it sticks pretty close to the book. But you know, it comes alive because what makes it so interesting is because of some of these supporting characters, Eileen Hackett, you know, as you said from the Bad Seed, she's right. fantastic in the Bad Seed. She was fantastic in First Wives Club when she played um, Diane Keaton that. Mom in that. You know, and she's fantastic in this. You know, Burgess Meredith, she, he's fantastic because he's a presence. Right. And, but Karen Black is, Karen Black, her personality doesn't really change. She becomes, she goes from stony to stonier. And Oliver Reed is kind of like a construction worker, a liver putty, and, a, you know, an, well, I guess a cockney construction worker. You know, so there's nothing... There's nothing loving about him. He's just kind of hard and stoic from the time that you see him and all the way to the end. They're, well, it's sort see, of like when he wants to get himself a little in the movie with Karen Black and she's just turning around screaming, no, not here, not here. Not here. And it just, I don't know, it just, that was so awkward. I well, just thought it was awkward. We, I mean, if it was somebody else, I can't even imagine who to put in that role. 
But I mean, it was just awkward. I think someone that looked like they were an English teacher might have helped, or someone who was a bit more thin. I mean, like, I think what we discussed on the phone yesterday, I think, you know, let's say that they put Roger Davis in it. I'm not saying that Roger Davis right. should have this role, but someone that was kind of sleek, you know, with the, you know, the tweed jacket with the, you know, elbow pads on it, you know, right, exactly. kind of slender. And, you know, show them in a loving relationship. Show them how they, much they love each other and everything like that. So when this, I mean, you know, when Oliver Reed attacks, you know, that she's like, oh, you know, I, I want to have you, I want to have you. And then she looks up at the window because she thinks what's ever in the window staring down, the house is staring down at her, so now she's embarrassed. Right. Get off me, get off me. And he's forcing himself on her. It's like, well, Oliver Reed looks like he probably forces herself on him all, all, her on all, all the time. I know. I don't know. I mean, he did good as like one of the the three musketeers. I mean, I, I could I could buy that. He did good with that. Yeah, um, but he but he always looks like he's the kind of person that probably date rape someone. He just has that kind of persona. I'm not saying yeah, that he did. I mean, like, he's like he looks like. But his role, his roles are always the same. Maybe. But his roles are always the same. He's always kind of a sleazy Cockney guy. You know, Oliver, sleazy Cockney guy. Tom. Me, sleazy cockney guy um three musketeers he's the 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 slimy comedy cockney guy you know he's right. always a co he's always like a slimy and so when he got him here and he's supposed to be like this lovable likable father it's kind of hard to place him right. and because because you don't have the beginning like you do in the book you you don't really get any sense of him at all you know but the only thing that you do get a sense of, and I thought this was fantastic, is Betty Davis, her character. She comes in vibrant, you know, she's vibrant, you know, she's fantastic. And then you see her like slowly decaying in front of your eyes. You know, she's like bright eyed and all of a sudden her eyes are becoming watery. And, and her skin know. looks thinner. They got her like looking kind of like, that you can see like through her skin it was porcelain, you know. I mean, she was definitely getting sick and she wasn't doing so hot. Yeah, and the thing is, is and she had life in her. You know, everything, you know, every line that she had had life in it. And it's like, and it's like the other two were just going through the motions. And then, you know, the whole premise of the story is that this house building itself back to its former splendor. And to be honest, the house didn't look any different at all. You know, the pool looked cleaner. And I, well, I know they did show where the pool, yeah, the pool area looked like. She goes, oh, it looks all brand new. It's all done. It's all whatever. She, she did that. But they, you didn't really see any improvement until the shingles and the wood, the, the wood slats started coming yeah. out of the house. But even at the end of the film is like when she goes running, you know, he goes running upstairs figuring out where she's going. I need to go say goodbye to Mrs. Blah, blah. And, you know, he goes running upstairs and the peeling, the wallpaper is still peeled. The outside of the house is still a bit shabby. You know, meanwhile, well, it we're didn't to be really vapor in. In the book, it totally like engulfs her whole presence, and it didn't really show that here. You really don't. It really wasn't. Um, the only thing that changed is the the um, the pool got the pool got cleaner, and they and it's almost like they you know where like sometimes in a film they put a lot of white furniture and put a bright light on it, so it like right. has like, this glow on it. They did that, so it's like okay, the pool looks okay. The pool's improved, and then of course the greenhouse improved. So we got you know someone went to the flower shop and bought a bunch of flowers, so it turned yeah. into a flower shop. And I mean the floors. I mean in the book the floors become shiny and new, and the wallpaper is also brighter and cleaner. And yeah, but the, you just didn't get that in the film. I think no. that that I think it's filmed beautifully. The director of photography did a really good job as yeah, far as the filming technique of this. But I think Dan Card Curtis did a big fail because, you know, these are the small details that may, that is the part of the film is what may, is supposed to what make the film. It's like, you know, if they made it today and you're like watching it and, you, and then they go into this shabby house and as the story goes on and you see these personalities change dramatically, not just from going like, you know, I want this house, I want this house. I want this house. You know, that's the thing. Right. You know, I don't know what they fucking dressed her in either. I mean, oh, Jesus Christ, when she's walking around that vampire dress thing, it's like, where in the hell did she pick that up? I know. What the hell was that? I was like, why is she dressed like that? And then she was like, really got into the silver. She had to like constantly scrub the silver. Well, the silver was from the, from the book. And I kind of understood that because she was like shining and everything's becoming shiny. That kind of reflects like how the house is starting to become shiny in the book. But they don't, right. there's no follow through. Nothing, you know, you know, it's like when you look at the doors, the, the glass doors, you know, 
you know, and the thing is, there's still kind of that, you know, where too, people, too many people smoke cigarettes in it, so it still has that, that nicotine. Red and yellowish tint to it. Yeah, and the thing is, in the book, you know, they turn it into brand new. It's like someone's replaced all the glass, and and you don't get any of that sense whatsoever. And the only time you get the sense that anything changed is at the very end when they're showing a picture of this brand new house that they're hanging on the wall. That's it. And then there's the pictures. But I mean, in the book, I guess I didn't notice it with the pictures. I probably have to freeze frame it again on, on my TV. But in the book, it said that the pictures of whoever was uh, it that was on wherever where she was, the house had pictures of everybody it, it engulfed, I guess. And they all look scared or upset or vague. Yeah. <laughs> like they didn't understand. I don't understand why the pictures were there that the, she just Well, they're, they're the people. Well, they're the people that the house has consumed in the past. Right. Because in the book, in the book, you do get a little bit of um, history because you got the, the family of six that had the house, bef- you know, that were there before. And if you, and see, this is what you have in the book that you don't have in the film because the book, the pictures on that mantelpiece or wherever, that table, they're all from different ages. So it's like, so, you know, and, you know, and the book is hinting that every so often this is what's happening. And that's the reason why I thought it was like a battery right. sort of thing that basically is, you know, she's, you know, she, they, she recharges it and eventually that battery is going to die. And then the house will start decaying, you know, like, you know, it's like when you have like, like when you have a, you know, an iPhone, right? You had the iPhone for the first year and it's running really, really fast and it's fantastic and it charges fantastically well. Then after a couple of years, all of a sudden it starts slowing down and, you know, it takes forever and eventually, you know, and then it gets yeah, that point Don't even where, get me going on my fucking iPhone. <laughs> well, you know, but, but then but after a while, it just doesn't charge anymore, you know, or if it does charge, it takes long, or you'll be able to charge it and you're lucky if it lasts a couple hours, you know, like, you know, like electronic kids do. Yeah, well, I mean, her hair, did you, did I don't notice, did you think her hair was changing color in the movie? I didn't well, really. They, they go, oh, you're going gray too. And it's like, okay, so, you know, I guess you had a couple of strands of gray. I mean, they they spend a lot of time on Betty Davis, you know, and her changes. You know, they mention her going gray, but it's like, okay, it's just like, you know, she had a couple gray streaks, but it wasn't like, you know, it's only at the very end. It wasn't the bride of Frankenstein quite yet, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, and this is another thing I think Dan Curtis lost it on. It's like, you know, she goes up to the room, she spends a lot of time in the room, but but there's this door and it's like this, you know, it's like when she looks at the door, it's like she's entering into space at the door. This is what's happening in the book. So, and, 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 there's, a, and there's that buzzing sound that's going on all the time. And, and, you know, and she, at first she thinks, it's, as she said before, the air conditioner, but there's nothing that here. This is just a wooden door. And then right. at the end of the, and then what we got then to here is this really kind of stupid ending, really. You know, he opens the door, she's sitting in a rocking chair and he goes, have you seen Marion or whatever? It's like, really, you can't tell that's your wife. You know, and she turns yeah. around, goes, ah, sort of thing, and he dies, and then she's just rocking in the chair. And well, he think, goes out the window, then then the kid gets the... And it fall, falls, you know, thingy. <laughs> and you think, <laughs> the, you, what do you call it, the turret, or what do you call it? I forgot what you call those things. But it's like you're kind of watching, and then you watch it kind of going, eh? Huh? Yeah. You know, but... Feel, yeah. And another thing I don't understand would... Dan Curtis films, and we, you know, we will discuss this with House of Dark Shadows, and this one, the beginning opening titles. It looks like a, it looks like an ABC TV movie. It's yeah. like these are the credits, and I, and to be honest, for the longest time, I thought until we started doing this podcast, and I did a bit of research on this, I thought this was a TV movie. I've always thought this was a TV. It looked movie. like a like a made for TV movie, like you know, something's like ABC Tonight or whatever. Yeah, it's like you know. You know, Halloween they, you know, time or find, find these old yeah you know on a well, Monday night. Well, it didn't night. scare me. I mean, it didn't resonate that much. Well, I mean, like I said, we what we did can I did Cannibal Ferox or whatever a couple by last mm-hmm. month, and I mean, there's just either it's either got it or it doesn't with me. I mean, I liked looking at the house, but I mean, I just thought that there was some mis mis cast people. Karen Black, she's probably a lovely woman. I don't know why she drives me fucking nuts. Don't know why. Um, I mean, I'm trying to. I, I think Dan know, Curtis liked her because he used her. So. Yeah, he used her a lot. Um, she bl- she blames Diane Curtis for kind of ruining her career. 
because Dan Curtis put her in Trilogy of Terror, and she said after that she could never she could never do a normal film. She just always got cast for horror films after that. Um, but then you know, so, you know, as we mentioned in previous um, podcasts, that in this time period is unfortunately if he became recognized for a role, you kind of got typecasted after that. Well, there wasn't social media. We had so many channels now. I mean, I see people that I see like like from Walking Dead is a good one. Walking Dead. Well, I'm not even. Gonna, well, I'm gonna say it because I think writers suck right now, and they fucked up my favorite show. Fuck mm-hmm. y'all. <laughs> but mm-hmm. when it comes to, I've seen a lot of the characters. They've all gone on to different stuff, and they've all integrated well. But, well, you know, you, I mean, you, but you do get that now. I mean, you know, it's like you'll watch like Little Big Lies. You'll get Reese Witherspoon and Meryl Streep and all these Hollywood actors doing a TV show. And or that or you'll got people on a TV show and they'll go do a movie and then they'll come back to the TV show and you know or uh, you know they they're it's so it's all very fluid now it's like but yeah but you can't you back then like things like that the seventies it was just you were either how many channels were, do we have on TV and like we had that one cinema where we me and you grew up at the town everybody had to come to Watertown to go to the movies just that one cinema. But it was, seg- I mean, it was segregated. You're either a TV actor or actress or you're a film TV actress. You didn't do right. both. And if you were a TV actress, yeah, it was good for you, but it was looked down upon. Right. And then if you're, and if you're lucky and you broke out to be a film star, let's say like Burt Reynolds, and I was like, well, you made it. You're a film star now. And they never went and they never looked back, looked back on TV until it got to like the end of the career and no one else had hired them. You know, and then they might, you know, and then they might well, come back. Like Dan and, Curtis and, got and, kind of stuck. Dan Curtis got kind of stuck in this genre too. I mean, you know, when when but like when the Dark Shadows came out in the '90s with Ben Cross, he knew he's just like, oh man, he goes, I'm there. You, I want to do something else. If you know, you go in to see like his uh, well, what what was that uh, documentary? I watched it. it was on Amazon. Yeah, Master Master of Dark Shadows. Yeah, I mean, he really wanted to break away and do something different. Well, he did break away. I mean, he did Warren Remembrance, which was one right. you know, of But, you know, it was back in the time that we had these great big sweeping miniseries. And right. Was, and then it was just, you know, you know, it kind of started with Roots, and we got quite a few of them, you know. Right. Some good. You know, I quite like the trashy ones. I like, like, Lace. Which one of your pictures is my mother? You know, I like Scruples. You know, I like, I like the I trashy I love Scruples. Ones. Yeah. I like Master of the Game with Diane Cannon. I loved all those. And he, and he has Shogun. Yeah, oh my a god, woman, I forgot about a Shogun. woman of substance. And I mean, you know, there's a ton of them. And it kind of, it, and you know, Dan Carter, Curtis kind of ended it with War and Remembrance. That's kind of like the last big miniseries, and then they they kind of went out of fashion. Oh, I, I mean, know. you don't want a lot of awards. What was it? He won a lot of awards, but he won Earth a lot of awards. And South came out like around eighty four, eighty five. But it wasn't War and Remembrance like eighty six. They were all like that in the mid-80s. I remember because I was in college and I was the only one with a color TV, a little TV that was a color TV, but everybody came in my room to yeah, watch well, we this had... 13-inch color TV to watch. Like, we love we also had Cain and Abel. Remember that one? Cain and Which Abel? Which one? Cain and Abel. Yeah. I think I Sam Neill or someone like that was in it. Or it was, I mean, they always had kind of the same cast coming through, probably through these ones, but... And then, you know, I think that, I think Warren Remembrance was the last big one. I mean, the, you know, the last of it, you know what I mean? It's like once that came out. You don't see it really anymore. I mean, well, for one, I don't watch cable TV that much. We've got, you know, I watch the news and the weather and I'm, mm-hmm. you know, when I watch General Hospital sometimes, but I always watch stuff like Hulu and Amazon and Netflix. And I mean, on my smart TV, they even have the news that's like newsy. It's not biased news. So, I mean, mm-hmm. I don't ever hardly watch cable anymore. I mean, so I don't. Even if it was well, on, I wouldn't know. But I've never seen any sweeping epic sagas, and not listen. Well, they don't. I mean, well, we, they're different now. I mean, you know, we do. We still have miniseries. Is it now? They're just series. I mean, Game of Thrones is a miniseries, really. Yeah, six you know years I mean? of miniseries. Yeah, I mean, but it didn't I mean, get me going on how it ended. I was really not. There was no. I just did not. Well, like I mean, it. but even if you look at simple things like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, I mean, that's lots of miniseries. That's like a soap miniseries. It has a beginning, middle, and an end, and then just sweet, you know. But we do still have them. It's just that, you know. But it's different. I mean, back then they were events. You know, every night at eight o'clock, it'd be this for like a whole week or whatever. That's what we had. You know, it was like, if you're going to watch Roots, it was every night for two weeks, you saw Roots. And it was like, everyone was talking about it. And Shogun, remember that? It was like, yeah. every night at a certain time, it was an episode of Shogun. And it only ran for like a week or two weeks. And then never again. 
So yeah, I wonder why they never bring those back. You hardly ever, I don't even think there's a channel. There probably is. I just haven't discovered it. Where all the old miniseries are, because like, who was it? Jane Seymour was like the queen of the miniseries. I mean, there's another one just uh, like yeah. her. Yeah, Jane Seymour. She did like East. She did an East of Eden one. I remember that. I remember yeah. watching that. Oh but, my god! I mean, you're, so, you're such a. You're such one. You're like one of the girls. You watch all this stuff. Me and these college girls watch. It's like, yeah. I mean, some of the guys would come in. It's like, what the hell are you watching? So. Well, I mean, it's like, you know, if you're growing up and, you know, let's face it, when you're growing up at home and you have three or four channels, your mom's the one with, you know, that decided what you were watching. Unless yeah. it was a sports night and then your dad might come in and watch something on sports. But you end up watching, what you, if it was drama or films, it was what your mom was watching. It's not like you had to say what you're watching. You know, I was watching I was, MTV constantly. I was just on the couch watching MTV. That was I mean, I head. think, you know, I think my mom gave me um charlie's angels so i could watch that but i think the only reason i could watch that because i think that was on one of the canadian stations and it was like early charlie's angels no it was on cbs wasn't it no it was on abc but see we didn't get abc because our antenna we wouldn't can pick up syracuse at the time oh so we could get we could get channel three but we couldn't get channel nine and channel nine was, was charlie's angels so that would show like at eight nine o'clock at night but then cbc which was channel six would show it the next day, like at seven o'clock or something like that. And my mom's cooking dinner, so we, I was able to watch Charlie's Angels. <laughs> and then, and then Friday night was kind of like when we could watch, we could watch what we wanted. And of course, at that time, I think it was Dukes of Hazard, Wonder Woman, The Incredible Hulk. Right. And then, and then once, well, it's kind of like you watch The Incredible Hulk or Wonder Woman, and then at nine o'clock, Dukes of Hazard comes and see your mom and your. Your rest of the family would join that. The adults would join in. And, of course, then they would finish up with da Dallas, you know. Right. You know, well, Dallas, then, that was like, Dallas was like the epitome of the 80s, though. That was yeah. the 80s. So you want to talk stuff like that. I don't know how we get off on these tangents, but we do. But it's all well, interweb. But well, the only time that when you're a kid that you can pick television is Saturday mornings. Yeah. You got to pick what you wanted to watch then. Bugs Bunny. Sometimes yeah. Speed Racer. Yeah, <laughs> Hong Kong Fui. Hong Kong yeah. Fui, number one super cop. I know that one. I love Hong Kong Fui. Yeah, Secret of ISIS. Oh, mighty ISIS. Oh, oh mighty Secret ISIS. Oh, yeah. What, what was that? Which one was that? ISIS. Oh, oh secret wind that blows up high. Lift me now so I can fly. <laughs> Space arc. <laughs> All this other stuff. But yeah, so I mean, you know, I'm, I just think that. You know, I'm not going to go into House of Dark Shadows because it's next week, but I think with right. burnt offerings, I don't, I mean, the thing is, I said before, I think it's beautifully filmed, but, you know, I think, he, I don't know if he's paying this by numbers or what he was doing, but he could have paid attention to more detail. The detail was missing. Well, I don't so, know if his heart was into it because it just wasn't typical Dan Curtis material as far as I was concerned. Yeah, but but think of it this way. Let's sit there and let's sit there and say that you're watching this movie with the same cast, same you know everything else. But now let's sit there and say you're watching it. But now all of a sudden the house is becoming brighter and it's cleaning up, and you watch it unfold. He's like, you know, he doesn't have to do it with special effects. This is like, you know, she leaves a room and she comes back in, all right. the doors are done, or she she leaves and comes back in and all the walls are painted or something. Is I mean, it doesn't take a mastermind to no. Um, do something to make it but it doesn't it doesn't look like it changed at all and as i said before the only time that you see it change is when they come back and she hangs the picture of the wall the outside of the house and all of a sudden you got this bright you know this white house that looks like it's been cleaned up on the outside and you're yeah. thinking okay so i think yeah i think he missed a lot of tricks but i think that you know i think you're left with all these great character actors, Betty Davis included, and if it wasn't for them, I think this would really be a no-show for me. Yeah, I have to tend to agree with you. So, but any last um, thoughts about Burnt Offerings, since we both loved it so well, much? I mean, <laughs> well, don't <laughs> listen to us, because just because we don't like something, people, doesn't mean you won't like something. And I mean, it wasn't a total, I mean, it wasn't, you know, yeah, it was a total loss, not a total loss, but it was, it just, I like, I'm so used to blood and gore and everything else that takes me, I mean, I don't know. I like you know really what, intense movies. You know what, just, the book you know, I you know the problem with this movie is, is that there's no dread in it. 
Yeah. You don't there feel you any dread. Now, if, if, if he filmed it to a certain point that there's this underlying dread in it all, you know, there's this, this dread and everything like that. I mean, the best bit is when the dream sequence is when that weird chauffeur. Um, Undertaker, Undertaker, who whatever is he that was. guy? The chauffeur, Undertaker guy. I've seen him before. Where? What? He's been around, and he always plays. Yeah, the now the, dude. that, that was the only freaky thing. That was the only freaky thing in the whole thing. Well, it was about a funeral. It was his mother's funeral? Oliver Reed was dreaming about, or yeah, but you know, this guy appears twice, and that was the best. Well, then thing. he comes with Betty Davis, and I think that's why she buys the farm. Well, that was quite good when they threw the coffin at the screen. That was quite well done. But yeah, man, I don't know. I think it's. I just think that he should have given more thought to detail. If he gave right. more thought to detail and and more thought to mood and ambiance, he could have pulled it off. But I don't think he pulled it off with this. I'm sorry. I think it's it's not unwatchable. You kind of watch it, and at the end of the day, you kind of go, eh, okay. What's yeah. next? Well, I mean, I love Dan, I love Dan Kurtz. I wish he was alive to, you know, give us hell and defend ourselves. We could interview him. <laughs> I would love to interview him. But <clears throat> I don't know. It's not that bad. I mean, I'm just used to faster paced movies, I guess. Uh, no, I mean, we I, watch I, so I, many of them. We read, but I thought the book was really good. I wish they would have stuck a little. I mean, like I said, it was a screenplay, which I just figured out. But I wish they would have stuck more to that because, they, like you said, the dread factor. And coming in on the end, because the end of the book, is it too clear to me how Ben and Dave died still? I went back and reread it. I was like, mm -hmm. what happened to these guys? Dave, did he drown in the book? Because it seems like he wasn't gone yet. You know, the thing is, I read the book, and I'm like you, I can't remember now. And, I mean, the problem with the, the problem with, I, I like the book a lot, and I love that, that you have these characters and you, and you see them changing and you feel them changing and you see everything changing and the house is changing and it, and it's, it's well written and, it, and it, there's an ambiance about the book that gives it, it's kind of had this weird feeling. You're not quite sure what's going on, but you know that everything's so minute that it's just slowly unfolding and it works really well. But, you know, like the film, I mean, the ending of it's kind of like, boof. Okay, and then you know they come back, and it's like okay. I like you know, but Betty then, Davis made her part intense. Like when, like you said, when the guy came in, the the, the dead chauffeur driver. Well, see, that's the problem. But that's the problem with the movie. Once Betty Davis is gone, you're stuck with these two, these three. Well, like we talked about before, it's just like you remember how we said we got to, at least if we had something like some kind of incentive to like the character, you were concerned as to what happened to them. Well, Oliver Reed and Karen Black, I did not give a fuck what happened in the movie. I was upset Betty Davis got killed. So. But, he, but even Davey was kind of like, well, eh. I mean, he's he like, was a man, like, blah, blah, yeah. He's bland. I mean, it was he's funny. like a bland was, little boy. Like I can't tell ego. you. It was a bland I, horror story. Yeah. And it could have been so much more. It could have. They could have done so much more with that house and with the plot. It could have kicked. Yeah. And I'm sorry, but you got to blame Dan Curtis for that. He had a right. great story. He, you got a, a director who miscast his film, and he didn't pay attention to any kind of details at all. It was like, you know, I'm not, not even going to put any money in fixing this house up. I'm just going to set the suit this, and it doesn't matter where we are in the story because it's just going to look the same. Yeah. And then hopefully people will walk away and think that the house got rebuilt and looks fantastic because what I'll do is I'll do the shingles falling off the roof, which you're not even aware that they're new shingles because all you do is see them falling off on the roof, but you don't realize that they're being replaced. He doesn't show it being, you know, what the, what the roof looks like afterwards. Right. You know, and then you get, and obviously the, the garage where the car's held on a totally different lot. It's not yeah. even stored at where they are because... He goes running down. Then they go have to run half a mile to where the garage is. You're like, where the fuck is this car? You know? I know. It was just like, it's just, yeah. It had and then you get and then you get this out. weird cut. It's like, and then they you know they're driving away. And it's like, because the thing is, when they run down the porch, they run left, and then it kind of you know they're running and running and running. So he's like, where the hell are they running to? And then they find and then you find this yellow house that you haven't seen before. It's like, okay, they got a yellow house here somewhere. The car's like, like twenty like, miles the away. Car's there. It's like okay. And they get in the car. They run off, and it's like, 
And the car should go back by the house, you know, because that's where they would go, right? Right. But it doesn't. It's like, well, where the hell was this fucking garage? Obviously, it was in another lot somewhere else. And he couldn't even piece that together. You know, a decent, I mean, you know, and, you know I'm sorry, but, you know, it sounds like I'm, you know, pissing off on Dan Curtis, but. We love Dan Curtis. This buoy just kind of sucked it. That's all. Well, you know, the thing is, if he paid attention to detail and stuff like this, and, you know, I know, you know, next next week when we get into it, we're going to be ha having the same issues. But, you know, you could have, I mean, it's, yeah, it's kind of like, okay, I'm going to film this, I'm going to paint it by numbers, and I'm going to throw it out there because I'm, I don't care. I also felt like I just don't care. Right. You know, I'm gonna, may, I mean, maybe they threw money at him. And maybe, maybe it wasn't like a love project or something like this. I go... We got this, you know, maybe MGM said, oh, Dan, you made us so much money with House of Dark Shadows. Why don't you do this script and we'll give you X amount of money and you can have whoever you want to and just make us money and we'll leave you alone. And he's like, well, right. I don't really want to do it, but I got a daughter going to university and I really need to pay for a university. So how I'll do it for the money. Maybe it's that. Who knows? So that brings us to the end. The, our episode of Burnt Offerings, the film by Dan Curtis. And next week, we'll be doing House of Dark Shadows and Trilogy of Terror, both directed by Dan Curtis. Of course, you can find us at www.llpodcast.com, and you can find us on all our social media platforms, which also includes Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and other social media platforms that you can find us on. If you, we're also going to be having a special interview with Roger Davis, the star of House of Dark Shadows and Dark Shadows. So make sure you tune in to us next week. So this is a goodbye for myself and goodbye from Vicky. Say goodbye, Vicky. Hey, goodbye, everybody. And we'll see you next week. Oh, it's beautiful. Just glorious. A chair is still a chair Even when there's no one sitting there But a chair is not a house And a house is not a home When there's no one there To hold you tight And no Nothing there but gloom But a room is not a house And a house is not a home When the two of us are far apart And one of us has a bro
Restored to us in all her beauty, her glory, with us once.